on tonight's panel. Former chairman of the Conservative Party, Secretary of State for Transport, Grant Chaps. Stephen Kinnock for Labour. He kept his seat. We're very glad to have him here this evening. Drew Hendry, re-elected last night for the SNP and the party's business spokesperson at Westminster. Broadcaster and writer at The Atlantic magazine, Helen Lewis. And Michael Dobbs, a Conservative peer, former advisor to Margaret Thatcher and author of House of Cards. Welcome to our panel here, to our audience here, and of course to you at home. You can argue along. You know the form by now using hashtag BBCQT on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram. Right, let's get started. On the day after the night before, Daniel Harris. Did Jeremy Corbyn lose the general election or did Boris Johnson win it? What do you think, Grant? Inevitably, a bit of both. Uh, I mean, I think the truth is that um, when two parties, and more parties obviously, but it boiled down to Labour or Conservative, are offering two different manifestos, uh, people look at both of them. I noticed when I knocked on doors, people were um, saying spontaneously to me, before I could have even got to them, um, whether they were Remainers like I was or Leavers, We've just got to move on. I'm just so bored of this going round in circles. We can't carry on like this. And, and that, of course, played were, into... Do you think say, people were voting into, for Boris Johnson with great enthusiasm? So or is I, I was the going least to say, that, play, that absolutely played into the which party is going to get Brexit done. Clearly, that was Boris Johnson. And then other people would say, you know, I will not vote for uh, Jeremy Corbyn because of... And they may have a different reason. So I think the truth of the matter is people vote for a whole combination of reasons. But in this election, in this case, as I think everybody has acknowledged, and I, I think this is true, people wanted to vote to unblock the country, to get things moving again. And I think that's the explanation for really a surprisingly large majority in the end. It was just the idea that we just can't go on like this. People just thought enough is enough. And said it was larger than you thought then, surprisingly yes. large. I, 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 in fact, the, the PM called me at 10 to 10. I sort of famous for my spreadsheets and Making, trying to make a prediction on, on this, and um, I thought that he would have a majority, but I have to say it took me by surprise. In terms so of what did you think it would be? About half the size. Wow. Stephen? Boris Johnson is a known liar. He lied to the Queen. He lied to our country. He leads a government that has gutted our public services, has absolutely seen a triggering of and an explosion in child poverty so and in homelessness. So how did he win then, Stephen? So I mean, it is absolutely clear this is not a Tory victory. This is a Labour failure. How could the Labour Party not defeat a government like this? After nine years of Tory failure, they've turned our country into an international laughing stock. They have decimated our public services. They have utterly failed to show the leadership that our country needs and they're tearing our communities apart and yet we could not beat them. And that is a damning indictment of Labour's failure, I am afraid to say. And I think that a lot of this came down to trust. I've knocked thousands and thousands of doors over the last five to six weeks and uh, on the doorstep in my constituency there were three key messages. One was on leadership. Mr Kinnock, we're sorry, we voted Labour all our lives, but we can't vote for you uh, whilst Jeremy Corbyn is your leader. On Brexit, they did not understand why we were not prepared to respect the result of the referendum and leave the European Union with a deal that protected jobs and livelihoods, something I've been arguing for for three years. And on the economy, there was a feeling that there was a scattergun approach with much of the radical change that we desperately need to see in our economy uh, somehow hidden under a smokescreen of too many promises and too much in there. It became something of a Christmas wish list. And uh, it is absolutely clear that when you're fighting a general election on that basis, you're fighting with at least one hand uh, tied behind your back. But I think most of all we have to be clear uh, that we've got to think now about the future of our country. We are looking down the barrel of five more years of austerity, of divisiveness, of incompetence, 
uh, and failure. You, what a tragedy that is for our country. When you talk about a failure of leadership, if you think about uh, the last Labour leaders, so you've had a centrist, Gordon Brown, obviously he didn't succeed, Ed Miliband, soft left, he didn't get anywhere. Now you've had Jeremy Corbyn twice, further to left, he hasn't got anywhere. Where does the Labour Party go? Well, we rebuilt from 1983 onwards. Uh, we have f famously had a, a manifesto in 1983 that was dubbed the longest suicide note in history. Um, but I, I and we what rebuilt I'm getting at is, is, is given what, what you've had in the past, <clears throat> is it fair to lay it so firmly at the feet of Jeremy Corbyn? Given the uh, failure of the other two? Look, look I, I think there were a whole range of factors here, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership was absolutely a major factor, but it's not possible to disentangle that from the failure to have uh, clarity on Brexit. It's, if if 17.4 million people have voted for something in 2016 and you go back to them in 2019 and say, we're not going to implement, if we get into government, what you voted for, but by the way, could you please vote for us in this, in this general election? It's not really surprising that you get the result you get in the North and the Midlands and in, in parts of, of Wales in our heartland seats. So we need to be a party that can reconnect with our working class heartlands. And until we do that, we will never find a route back to number 10 Downing Street. Uh, Daniel, you asked the question. Yeah, What's your isn't view? there a more fundamental problem, though? Um, I think I'm correct in saying that if you take out the two, uh, the, the Blair victories, Labour haven't won a general election in 50 years. Well, <laughs> I, I think that there is... Uh, there is a fundamental problem, which is that we have over y the years, I think, been losing touch with our working class heartlands. Uh, and that uh, problem was heartland? turbocharged by Brexit. Uh, and uh, our decision to shift to a position of not respecting the result of the referendum uh, and going for a, a good deal that protected jobs and livelihoods, which is the position we had in our 2017 manifesto, <laughs> Uh, where we did far, far better than uh, expected. And, and I think that when you put those issues of leadership and trust together with that particular issue around Brexit, uh, that uh, was, I think, the, that, that was the, that fundamentally at the heart of this failure in this general election. True. Well, I think it's important to point out that um, both Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson lost in Scotland and lost heavily. Um, and I, I think the, the problem for both was that they weren't listening uh, to people in Scotland. Uh, we saw from Labour a complete lack of leadership, you know, an un inability to find a position, to take a position on uh, Brexit or indeed in Scotland on independence, their inability to, uh, to go with the, the mood of the public, which is clearly that we want a choice into the future. And we've seen Boris Johnson and his government just standing fast against the will of the public. Now, this is the fourth election that the SNP have won in Scotland and won it with a manifesto to say that Scotland should have a choice over its future. And yet that continues to be ignored by both parties in Scotland. And you can't ignore people, wherever you are in the nations of the UK, you can't ignore people because that's the way you lose the, will, you lose the support of the people and you lose the ability to represent them. They're just not listening, both of them, but I think the Labour Party have had an absolutely critical problem in their lack of leadership. Okay. Does anyone... You, you, yes, because you, you've been quite... Suspiciously quiet, and I wonder what's going on here. Uh, oh, hang on, suddenly lots of hands up. Let's, yes, the man here in the, um, in the coat, yes. Um, to Stephen, I'm a former soldier in the British Army, and I'm offended by your leader's comments, associations with terrorists, etc. You'd have had more chance of winning if you brought your dad back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the man at the back now. Uh, is it time for... Is it time for Labour to abandon socialism, as it clearly doesn't work in England? OK, I'm just going to go round a number of people, if I may. Yes, the woman there with white sweater. So, obviously, Brexit took a large stance. Why weren't other policies, such as education and student needs, highlighted as well? OK, I'm just going to round that. Innocent, if you keep, keep your hands up, otherwise I, I, I lose track of you in the audience. Yes, the man there. Is the SNP listening to the 55% of people who voted for union-backing parties last night in Scotland? OK, I think we may, that subject we may come on to later. Yes, and just the woman in the front here. Um, why is there such a big focus on Brexit when there's a load of teenagers dying every other week and 
is very... Are you, to are you talking about knife crime? Not even just knife crime, just generally. Every, every party's manifesto is about let's get Brexit, let's get Brexit done, let's move forward with Brexit, but a lot of people are dying and terrorist attacks are growing and nothing's... In, in my opinion, nothing's being done in people in Labour's manifest manifesto, Conservatives' manifesto. It's just all based on Brexit, 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 and I just don't think it's right. It's not the most important mm -hmm. thing to you. Yes, mm -hmm. it's the woman there. Yes, you. Me. Um, I think uh, Stephen is completely right when he suggests those three key points as to why the Labour Party lost the election, Corbyn's lack of leadership, uh, a failure of a clear position on Brexit and a poor manifesto, but he's shying away from the fact that another one of those key reasons is anti-Semitism that's rife Absolutely. in the Labour Party. And you need to be, the Labour Party needs to be honest and clear and have a strong position on getting rid of anti-Semitism from the Labour Party if they truly want to win the next election. And can I just ask, because I, I know there will be, is there anyone here in the audience who wants to speak up for Jeremy Corbyn? Yes, you there. I think to simplify the debate by having a problem with Corbyn is ridiculous. I think you need to look at the smear campaign against him, the media bias, which has been shocking, disgusting in this country. Corbyn, right from the beginning. Yeah. Right. The fact that I managed to pick you out hopefully is not an example of that. Uh, Michael. Um, I rather hope that the Labour Party finds some way of digging itself out of the hole that it's made for itself, because I believe that, uh, you know, we're going to have a Tory government for the next five years, quite possibly for the next ten or more years, because that's the, the normal cycle of things. But it's always better for a government to have a healthy opposition. Well, the question, though, Michael, was, was is because it's, it's not just about Labour. It's, did Jeremy Corbyn lose it or did Boris Johnson win yeah, it? Yeah, but the, but, the, but the point I was going to make is that the, the way that Stephen goes about it, I mean, he treats... I'm, I'm afraid that your, 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 your comments rather treated the electorate who have just elected by an overwhelming majority of Conservative government with contempt. You're saying, you know, the, 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 you know, it's all about we must concentrate on the future of the country. What do you think that the electorate were voting for yesterday other yeah. than the future of their country? They decided that Boris Johnson and the Conservatives had a much better record than your party with its anti-Semitism, which you have failed to deal with over years, and the first thing that I believe that you must do to get the Labour Party together again is to accept plural, plur, plurality. In other words, that people have a right to another opinion than yours and clean up the, this, the despicable momentum anti-Semitism that you've been dealing with. Can I come back to you in a moment? Helen, I just want to hear what you've got to say. I had a really difficult time this election and actually I thought for the first time ever I might spoil my ballot and I felt like I was being asked to choose between Boris Johnson who has been sacked twice for lying from jobs, not mm. classically a great asset for someone who wants to become our Prime Minister, uh, you know, who was unable to answer really fundamental questions, who was a social liberal and a pro-banker guy when he was London Mayor and is now running on a tough law and order policy. I don't know who the real Boris Johnson is that people have voted for, frankly. <laughs> I do come to Jeremy Corbyn and having been a journalist I previously worked on a left-leaning magazine I've seen what it's like to try and cover the Labour Party fairly and it is very hard because it is incredibly defensive for any criticism of the Labour Party and I'm sorry but sometimes you do have to face the fact that you are not perfect Jeremy Corbyn is very much not perfect on anti-semitism and he had a campaign where I'm afraid he was defensive petulant and pious and I think that was repulsive to a lot of people and I got into the ballot box and I thought I don't think any of you people deserve to be in charge of, of this country. I don't. Now, when you have um, a, a, a Labour government, or, sorry, a Labour um, team that couldn't beat a Conservative that had problem with Windrush, the bosses that went to communities to say, go back home. You had, you know, Grenfell. You know, there's problems you know, there's mass racial inequality. The black and ethnic minorities, people are now saying on the first time in their lives, we want to go home. But they were born here, lived here, pay their taxes here. <coughs> and then people are telling them on the streets, go back to where you belong, because we don't share the same color. And that, that Tory government still won an election by a vast majority. It's, it's, I can't believe that Labour 
could lose an election for, with, a, with somebody like Boris that his statements, pick it, you know, letterboxes, you know, smile like pickaninnies, you know, making jokes about, oh, people like money like Nigerians. And then Labour still lost mm -hmm. with that. Imagine, yeah. sorry, your, you know, your guy, Stephen, your guy is just not electable. And until you go back to where Tony Blair, where you won three elections massively from the centre, until you go back there, you will be in oblivion forever. Okay. I'm going to take a couple more points. I'm going to allow you to if you want. Yes, the man at the back. And then the woman in the yellow sweater. Yes, the man well, at the back. I think picking up on that, I think it's been absolutely disgraceful that the primary discussion of racism in this election has been the anti-Semitism of 0.1% of Labour members when you have someone like Boris Johnson who has presided over uh, a Tory government that has been responsible for Grenfell, for the hostile environment, who in his own words has said the utterly uh, vile racist things that he has. And I think it, it's, it's a, an indictment of the media of the way they've presented this issue. I think, I think Stephen Kinnock should be reminded of his face on the exit poll at the last election. And what we see is the difference between the last election and this election is not Jeremy Corbyn, it's not his personality, it's not his manifesto, but it was the Brexit position and that's something to discuss. But for you to lay the blame on Jeremy Corbyn, particularly after it was your colleagues on the right of the party that pushed him to adopt that position of a second referendum, is absolutely abhorrent. Well, I, I think that we've got three questions that we have to answer as a Labour Party. Do we actually want to win elections? Do we want to be a party that can change this country for the better? And there's a very simple answer to doing that. There's a way of doing it, which is to win general elections. We have just suffered the worst de defeat since 1935. So you may well talk about my face uh, on the TV screen, sir, but I'm telling you that my face last night was far, far worse because we, have now, we are now looking down the barrel of five more years. If you think that's a success for that's Jeremy Corbyn, because... you're welcome to your thoughts, but I'm telling you that it is not. Can we move beyond blaming the media? Look, the, we have a right-wing media in this country. That is a reality. It always has been. I assume you're, Just not, you're not including every... uh, the BBC in that. Well, uh, absolutely, the BBC. <laughs> BBC is the I, I'll let the audience speak for itself. I assume you're, assume you're talking but, uh, about you know the press. What? You know what? It, there's nothing worse than when you watch a football manager uh, after a football match who's just lost, blaming the referee. Nobody respects a team where they blame the referee for <coughs> losing. We just have to win elections. Sometimes we are up against it. There is a right-wing media. Get over it. We've got to, as a party, factor that in. And thirdly, can we recognise that Leave voters are a vitally important part of Labour's past, present and future? And until we answer those three questions in the right way, we will never get into power. And to Michael's point about treating the electorate with contempt, absolutely the opposite. I fundamentally respect the damning verdict that the electorate has given to the Labour Party uh, in this general election. I am simply pointing out that we are up against uh, nine years of incompetence, failure, austerity, smashing our NHS to pieces, an explosion in homelessness, four million, million children in poverty. If we can't beat that, then we've got some very serious questions to answer. Uh, what about the points about Boris Johnson, which is something we hear time and time again on Question Time, so, speaking in terms of his, his remarks. It's interesting. You can, if, you, if you talk to somebody who, uh, about Boris Johnson, and uh, almost everyone says on the doorsteps, great London mayor, then we weren't really sure about him as foreign secretary and we're not sure as prime minister. But the fact of the matter is that Boris Johnson is probably the first prime minister in history not to have a majority in the House of Commons. And our system isn't designed to have a Prime Minister in Downing Street and not have a majority. And so, because he was always up against it. I think what you're going to find in yeah, this hang next... Hang on, hang on, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Theresa nothing to do with no, 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 right. no, she did have a majority. Though, but she, she lost... She had the DP. She, yeah, but the and comments then, that were being referred to... Yeah. No, no, so let me, let me come on to that. But it didn't so make her write racist articles. So hold on a minute. What I'm going to say is, I think what you're going to see under the next four or five years is a One Nation completely united Conservative Party who has actually now won seats in every part of, uh, the, uh, uh, of England and what into said, Scotland and, and 20 what said in Wales. Let me just finish, let me just, would, let me just, why, let me just finish, denounce it? Let me just finish the point. Why would you simply denounce why, it? Why don't let me finish the point and I'll, I'll actually get on to this. So what you're going to see is a Conservative Party who's got members of Parliament elected in seats which only Labour have uh, ever held beforehand 
And we're going to govern this country in a way where I think you'll see Boris Johnson coming forward as a prime minister who brings the country together, heals some of these divisions, because a lot of people, as I said in my first answer, just want to move beyond this very raucous, rancorous time when people are each other's throats, and not just in political parties, on a panel like this, but actually within their own homes. And this country can be a lot better than that, and that is what we're going to do under Boris Johnson and this new Conservative sorry, government. Aunt Fiona, but sorry, Bor Boris Johnson is leading that division by the kind of oh. language he uses. <laughs> Okay. You cannot defend that, surely. It, it, you know what's so extraordinary about having this discussion? Not 24 hours, not even 24 hours from when 43.6% of the electorate have gone out and voted for the party that he leads. You guys, uh, speaking as you do, are actually, you say you respect the electorate. The electorate have just voted for this One Nation Conservative government. It's going to bring the country together and okay. unleash our well, potential let, let's take a for the question. future. And I know that in this audience there are people who agree with me, and I know that there are people around the country who are looking forward to a country that is more united going forward than it's been for the well, last three Let's take a years. question on, on that from Chiara Callan. Chiara, where are you? Ah, oh, there you are. Elected on an utter blank canvas of a manifesto, could we now be about to find out who the real Boris Johnson is? Right. Well, this is what you're referring to. Uh, Drew, do you want to kick us off on that? Well, I, I think uh, Boris Johnson is a, it's a grim situation, I think, in the rest of the UK just now. You know, the, uh, the Boris Johnson government, I think, is the worst possible thing for the UK. I, I, I represent Inverness as part of my constituency, and there we've had for the past six years, we were a pilot area, universal credit uh, being rolled out. It's absolutely hammered people locally. We've gone from one food bank in Inverness up to four. And, and that's been a process, and, and many more throughout the constituency have joined that. People have been driven into poverty by that particular policy, and it has uh, terrible consequences with it as well, such as the rape clause and the six-month uh, rule for terminally ill people, which can be done away with, but they haven't done it as a Tory party. Now, wh what's going to happen, I think, with Boris Johnson and his, and his majority is that's going to get even worse. I think they're going to tighten the screw on the people who are most vulnerable in our communities. The disabled. I think they and, and the, the single parents, those people who just can't afford it. You know, I, I think this is going to be a, a really awful time with a Tory majority in place. And I think we will see more of what we already know about Boris Johnson, which is a pretty grim prospect. Michael, is that your view? <laughs> um, I'm just wondering whether Drew and his colleagues in the SNP are actually going to start taking responsibility for life in Scotland that they have been responsible for. Happy to answer that. Um, they're, they're, they're responsible for the health service there, which is suffering now in Scotland, much more so than uh, anywhere The question is actually about Boris Johnson there, if I can remind well, you. It's, and it's not true. Um, Boris Johnson is, uh, uh, is a phenomenon. He, he's different from other... Prime Ministers. That's why he's made such a very good leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister and done things, achieved things that people three months ago said were impossible. We wouldn't be standing or sitting here now looking at the prospect of getting on with Brexit um, if he hadn't been able to ch do things which people simply said weren't possible. They were <laughs> impossible on. under. Yeah. Hang on, he picked up a deal that Theresa May rejected essentially. <laughs> In order to put a border down no, with the Irish no, Sea, that no. was always a possibility to screw over the DUP, but it was just not done until he no, came no, along no. and thought uh, he could gamble Europe on has it. Moved. Europe has come back to the negotiating table, something that was said was impossible to do. Now, Boris and the Conservative Party is at last in a really strong negotiating And position. what's going to happen, because, Michael, with the Conservative I mean, if you yes. think about, for example, the, the ERG, who've held so much sway... No until now. Well, what's going to happen there? I mean, what kind of Conservative Party are we going to see? We're going to see a very effective Conservative Party because it's much more united than it has been for a very long time. It was a painful but no, process. But I'm asking, in terms of, in terms of the, 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 the MP, is not that great in, in number. We were, we were very much to the right of the party. We were pushing Brexit, Brexit pushing a hard Brexit, Jacob Lee, Smalls, and others. Yes. What's, what's going, what's going to happen to, to those kind of people? Now, are they now... Boris Johnson doesn't have to worry about them. They leave the party in a different way. What kind of party can we expect to see? It's going to be a party that's dealing with the future and the ambitions of the future. How do we get 
out of this system, this newly negotiated system that we're going to do with you, how do we get the things that we really want? We're not going to simply sit there as we were doing up until very recently, saying to, the, to Brussels, what are you going to allow us to do? We're actually in a position now to say, this is what we are going to do. We want your cooperation. We are friends, we are partners, we are colleagues, but we are no longer going to be doing the same things as you are because we have a different horizon that we want to get to. There's nothing... Evil with that is just a different ambition, and British people are actually very good at achieving their ambitions. It's about unleashing the imagination, the innovation that we know that we have, and we weren't able to do that with the system that we were just getting out of. And at the end of January, we will now be in a new position to do things which... Uh, Two years ago, we were told were absolutely extraordinary and impossible. We are going to do them. Helen? I'm looking rather frustrated because I think rather like the Tories' 2015 slogan was a long-term economic plan. I challenge anyone in this room to remember what the long-term economic plan actually was. And I think we get break down. There's a big problem, which is that in, in, we have a, a year that is written into the Tory manifesto that we will be out by the end of December next year. That is the that will be the fastest trade deal that anyone has ever done. I mean, if Boris Johnson can accomplish it, take my hat off to him. But I think he has made a big promise. That, and he has told people this subject's going to go away. And I think when the subject doesn't go away, we're going to feel quite cheaty. Okay, let's hear some from us. There's a woman at the back there. So, so my concern is that um, you, you said, Michael, that we need a healthy opposition. I completely agree. But the concern that those people who were originally maybe Labour supporters that moved to Conservatives have an uncertainty that. Uh, the, uh, the real Boris Johnson, Johnson will not follow through on the things he said prior to the election. So um, um, I feel that there's a real concern around how the real Boris Johnson will he follow through on the promises he's made, for instance, with the NHS and other aspects as well. Um, and without a healthy opposition, is there a safeguard in place uh, for that? Okay, and the woman in the grey jacket, yeah. you wanted to say something. And actually, can I just say, if, when you put your hands up, if you keep them up, because if you put them down, I, I lose you, so they go. Conservatives have been in power for 10 years. The housing crisis has got worse and worse. What's going to happen now? Well, the question is about are we going to find out who the real Boris Johnson is? It was, it was a, a, a little haiku of a manifesto that we saw for this election. It's yeah, a, relative to other parties. It's, it's, it's a fully. It's, it's a fully. It's, it's a pretty slender document, as you know full well, Raj. So what, what are we going to see? What, so, so kind of parties, I, I what think, kind of future are you yeah, revisioning? I think the reality yeah. is uh, that what you want to see with Boris Johnson is someone who's liberal, moderate, one nation, compassionate, uh, who puts the NHS right to the heart of it. And let's see now, because with the majority, I think, uh, you'll actually get to see it as, as the question sort of suggests the real Boris Johnson, much more like the London so who is Mayor, there? much more like the London Mayor, who actually, by the way, very liberal, very open, and uh, very, very keen to get on. I mean, when I started to mention before, he was a uh, Prime Minister in the last Parliament who didn't have a majority, which is unheard of. That actually made it very difficult to be Prime Minister. I think you'll find, with a bigger majority, with 80 million, with eight, sorry, eight, uh, 80 MPs, uh, majority, he will be in a position to... I knew you were ambitious. Yeah, yeah. Really, that's ridiculous. I told you my projection was a bit off the beat. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you'll find with that sort of uh, majority, um, you, you'll see the, the, the kind of one nation Conservative Prime Minister can be. And I do have to say, particularly to you, to you the idea, as you've done twice here, um, uh, that you, you just don't seem to understand that 14 million people have just gone out and voted for him as Prime Minister, including, as the question I mentioned up there, a lot of first-time Labour supporters who vote Conservative. And you're assuming it's just for, for Brexit. But the way that you're talking about people, the, well, and we accept the challenge. What we're saying is, we understand you voted because of Brexit, but we are going to really show you how good and how effective a Conservative government can be in areas like Darlington and Workington and all those other seats that we want. And if your attitude is, you were just wrong to vote Conservative, you'll find in five years' time, when we've actually delivered for people in this country, on NHS, on health and all the other areas, then actually you'll have a rude awakening of vote. And what can we expect to see? Because obviously Boris Johnson has promised, well he promised to come out on 31st of October and that didn't happen. He's promised that we're going to come out um, of the EU completely December 2020. Now that he doesn't have the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg, others breathing down his neck, 
Is that a promise he's going to keep, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the 31st of... So that's an absolute of... well, guarantee, well, to be clear, whether we have a deal or yeah, not. To be, to be clear, we didn't come out on the 31st of October because, as I've mentioned, there was no majority in Parliament. Now there is, not quite the 80 million I quoted, but now there's an 80 majority in Parliament. It does mean that we can fulfil coming out on the 31st of January. We'll get that work started But as far as December Christmas. 2020 and is concerned, December with a deal or not, is we'll come out. Absolutely. Because, you know what, although you say it takes years to negotiate trade deals, how many trade deals have ever been negotiated in the world where you already have exact parity on your products, on everything going into this. How many trade deals have there ever been negotiated where you're putting up barriers to trade rather Indeed. than lowering them? The, 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 the point about this is, is when we leave, there are already 50 countries with which we have rollover trade deals, so with, in terms of the rest of the world. So there's already a lot in place. And in terms of Europe, they sell more stuff to us than we sell to them. So why on earth would they not want a trade deal? And by the way, exactly the same argument. No, no one's saying they wouldn't want a trade deal, okay. whether you can do it by the yes, end of absolutely. December. Trade deal. And why not? You've already got the same playing field well, going in. The, customs uh, the, the woman in the yellow sweater there, yes. Yes, a uh, question to Grant, please. Uh, you say that Boris is uh, going to be a moderate one-nation Tory. Yet how does that, uh, in my opinion, actions speak louder than words? He lost the majority because he actually chucked out of the party the very 21. moderate nation yeah. uh, Tories, like Dominic Grieve and yeah. David Gork and so So how, how do you respond to that? Look, uh, briefly, OK, and then okay. I want to go around you. Well, look, when you stand as a, on, for any of the parties, you stand for a document like this, which is a manifesto, and you say you're going to do what's in it. One of the things that was in our last manifesto is that everybody who signed up said we would vote to leave the EU. Those people didn't and knew that the consequence of that would be to lose the whip. Half of them got it back, by the way. And that kind, you have to have some sort of discipline in a political party, and it's absolutely right to do. And actually, I think the evidence of it is that we now have an 80 majority because we've got MPs now who have all signed up to the manifesto, and that means the public know we're going to do what it says in the manifesto. In the manifesto. Lots of hands up. The woman with the glasses there, yes. Um, so, uh, sorry, I just forgot my question. Basically, you say that Boris Johnson is a liberal, um, a, a person for the people, right? But when will you actually investigate the Islamophobia that is currently occurring in your country, in your party, that you, ne you, don't, you don't talk about, but you talk about Jeremy Corbyn and his anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, which is fair and it's right, fair and it's right. But well, will you actually address the Islamophobia that's occurring in the Conservative Let Party? Let me take a few points and then you can answer. The woman in the blue sweater here with the, with the necklace. I have to take issue with you on your comment that um, Boris Johnson is a man of compassion. I have not seen any evidence of compassion in his behaviour yeah, to towards a child yeah. on a hospital floor. Yeah. I have not seen any compassion when he stands for a photo shoot uh, in front of a bunch of police cadets and one of them faints in the heat and then he just carries on. If, where is the compassion in this right. man? Where is his compassion for the homeless chap? He was, wa he was filmed walking by with his aides and with his team. I see no compassion in this man. Man in a white t-shirt. Um, do you think Boris Johnson had a bit of an easier run in this campaign against a not very effective Jeremy Corbyn and against a more competent Labour leader who need to move back towards the centre-right to appeal to the voters that he borrowed from the Labour Party in this election? OK, let's just hear from the woman here in, in the black cardie. Um, I think um, Labour lost the election because they didn't respect democracy. Democracy means when you vote and you have a referendum, whether you like it or not, that's it. We voted to leave. How dare you? How d I'm a Labour voter. Yeah? How dare you say you're not going to respect that? That's, that? That, for me, was the primary reason that I walked into the polling booth yesterday for the first time in my life not knowing which way I was going to vote. Yep. Absolutely abhorrent that we didn't respect what people said. Absolutely abhorrent. Secondly, the real Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson, he will swing with the wind. He'll do, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, he'll do whatever makes him popular. He wanted to be Prime Minister, he wanted to be Labour, um, Mayor of London. Whatever was going to get him that role, he doesn't care. He's not a man of compassion, he's not a man of conviction, and he's not a man of morals or ethics. I think he's a disgusting <laughs> Prime Minister. I feel embarrassed to have him as the Prime Minister of this country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll come back to you in a but Stephen, uh, obviously the point made to you about the referendum, clearly you wanted you, uh, a group of MPs, you got together to try and see if you could get some kind of Brexit deal through. The question originally from Chiara is, 
could we be about to find out who the real Boris Johnson is? Well, I think all of these points are absolutely valid. When the mask slips, this One Nation stuff just falls away. He sacked 21 One Nation MPs. He couldn't look at a photograph of a young boy on a hospital trolley. He uses racist rhetoric like uh, letterboxes and bank robbers. He, he, uh, he wrote two articles for the Daily Telegraph before the referendum. One saying advocating remain, one advocating leave, and the only thing he really calculated what, which was best for his career. So, the, but, but, but Boris Johnson isn't a one nation Tory, he's a one Boris Tory. Yeah. <laughs> there are members in the audience here who clearly voted for Boris Johnson. We've had a lot of people saying why they didn't support Jeremy Corbyn, why they didn't support Boris Johnson, others who have supported Boris, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. No one's actually spoken up for Boris Johnson. I know there must be some. So, are you one of them? I didn't vote for Boris, oh, but I know okay. why. I know why he is. Well, I, I sympathise with him in, in the way that he stood up for Brexit. That's the only reason why I would say Boris Johnson. He stood up for Brexit. He was the only leader who stood up for Brexit. Okay. What about so? So, anyone here who actually voted Boris Johnson because they actually wanted him? Yes, you stand in the front. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't very good, and Boris Johnson wasn't perfect either. But by a thumping majority, the nation has decided that out of the two, Boris Johnson was the best choice. And we've got to give him a chance. It's his first day, and we'll see how it goes, and we'll make a decision in five years' time. Okay. And Grant, you want on some of the points? Well, look, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, on. he's the least uh, worst. Uh, honestly, That's what you're uh, honestly, Stephen, when you, when you start to talk about, he wrote two articles. How many times have you taken a piece of paper when you have a difficult decision? And actually, I think something like whether or not we should vote to leave Europe is a difficult decision. Do you draw a line down the middle and you put the pros and the cons? And he does that as a writer, as somebody who writes that. And if you take the time to read both those articles, then you actually see his arguments from his perspective for leaving were way stronger. So to keep trotting out he wrote for two articles career. and therefore this is terrible. And by the way, you know, this, oh, it's for his career, as if, like you as a politician, it's not for your career. Politicians, of course, stand on things they believe in for their careers. And in many other ways, and many of the other comments, compassion, if I take that issue as an example. I worked very closely with him. I happened to be housing minister at the time when he was mayor. And he's very, very, very passionate about the issue of homelessness, to the point where he introduced a policy which was a first, called the No Second Night Out policy, which meant that anybody who's on the street would automatically be uh, caught up by the outreach teams and found accommodation on the second night out. Homelessness is a much more complex issue than most people realise. For example, in this country, people who are not British citizens, they don't have automatic rights recourse to public funds meaning that they don't automatically get housed. One of the issues that that ties into, therefore, is the ability of people to come and live here, That is move a government here, policy without, no, related... No, to do with being in the EU. People can come and live here, and it means you they don't have a cost... You money if you wanted to. Under of course, the Labour but imagine government, what you would do homelessness you did, fell. No, but imagine it what... It is possible to make homelessness what, fall. OK, I've actually, I've actually tackled this one. Let's just think about this for a moment. Let's say that we do say that everybody should have recourse to public funds. What will happen next? Answer, more people will come here because it's an automatic way of being able to get housed. And so it's a much more complex policy but than we you're were in the trying EU. to suggest. But hold on, we're going to get way off subject. The yeah, point and I'm also making you're going off an awful long time. So the the point I'm making is, actually, to simply say that somebody has no compassion without looking at the way that that person has worked, in fact, in this case, as London Mayor, to try to solve homelessness is really not to look at the full track okay. record. Well, I'm going to move on from this uh, precise element in a moment. But before we do, I just want to ask you, Stephen, since we've got you here, where does Labour go now? In terms of... And we know Jeremy Corbyn is going to stand down. He said so. Other people, some have called for him to stand down immediately. He's not doing that. Who would you support to take his place? Yourself? <laughs> I, I, I really don't think we should get into names right now because we've got some big, big questions oh, to answer. On. Don't I think, tell me I think that in that the, the party people aren't talking names. The leadership of contest they are. should happen very soon. It should be done and dusted by How Easter. Soon? It should be done and dusted by Easter. We need a new leader in place and by Easter. And would you Easter. stand? Uh, I have no plans to stand. Um, I think, uh, you're standing. You're standing. I think that there is a very strong case for the next leader of the Labour Party to be a woman. So is, is there anyone that you would like to stand? I think we have some brilliant candidates out there. People like Lisa Nandy, Jess Phillips, Keir Starmer. Uh, they get Emily your Formbury. vote. There are many, many good people out there. But I think we need, first of all, 
to be clear about the question that has to be answered. And that question is about how do we reconnect with our working class heartlands, those people that deserted us at this election. Uh, I think one thing that uh, the Prime Minister was right about, that I agree about, was a lot of those people lent their votes uh, to the Conservative Party this time. We've got well, to get hoping. them back. And that requires uh, credible economic policy. So we are trusted on the economy again. Patriotism. We love this country. The Labour Party took the United Kingdom into NATO. That's one of the proudest achievements of this party. Ernest Bevan signed that document in 1948. Uh, we are the party of, of defending our country, of standing up for our armed forces. And it's heartbreaking for me to hear what the gentleman there said. I think he's a veteran himself, uh, that he couldn't support the party because he doesn't think we believe in national security and defence. We need to be a patriotic, realistic, but radical party with the economic policies that recognise that this Conservative government has been destroying this country and its public services and dividing the economy up uh, so that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer for nine long years and that has to stop. I'm just going to tell you before I move on about our plans uh, in the new year. We will be in Oxford on the 9th of January and the following week we will be in Liverpool. So if you want to be in the audience for either of those programmes, call 0330 123 9988 or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. All right, let's take a question now from Stephanie Hampel. With an increase in support for the SNP, um, is it time to say goodbye to Scotland? Well, we all know what you're going to say to that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think there's a really important point that Grant Chaps made earlier tonight. He, he quite rightly said that, and I don't like this, but he quite rightly said that yesterday's election gave a mandate for Brexit in England. I, I've been ag against that. I think it would be best if the UK stayed in the EU uh, as a whole. But, um, but I think he has been right. They got 43.6% of the vote <coughs> and something like 56% of the seats. And uh, he said that that was in the, the manifesto and they must take that forward. So I think it also follows that uh, the SNP, who won 45% share of the vote in Scotland, who took 80% of the representatives and have in their manifesto and have for the last four elections, that Scotland should have a choice over its future. It should be able to put whether or not Scotland wants to stay in a Boris Johnson broken Brexit Britain or if it wants to take its own place as OK, a but you haven't mentioned that 54 percent of votes yeah. in Scotland supported the well, union. You know, we, we've just said, you know, look, this is about we live in a parliamentary democracy where we have to fight elections based on our manifestos. That's what we did yesterday. The SNP won a thumping result yesterday, 80 percent of the seats in Scotland on a manifesto that said that Scotland should have a choice over its future. That's the important thing, not independence, because some people will agree and some people will disagree with independence, but the important thing is to listen to people and give them their choice over the future, to see whether or not they want to take one path or another. That's surely a democratic principle, and it's not up to anybody at Westminster, Boris Johnson or anyone else, to stop any of the members of the public in Scotland having their choice. But hang on, their that, that, that's, that's all very well, and I'll come to you, Grant, in a minute. But we know that Boris Johnson has already, in fact, he's spoken in the yeah. insurgency, said he is not going to allow her to do that. So what are you going to do about well, that? It, you so know, what happens next? The, the people in Scotland are sovereign. That's the way it should be. You know, if you look at all of what's happened over the past three and a half years, the argument has yeah, been about what do? people... Yeah, but what will you do? I'm asking what you'll actually do well, now. Well, we, we are going to request a Section 30 order to make sure this is done as a part of a and legal And Boris Johnson has already said he's not well, going to do that. Well, so what you know, you, well, what, what's going to happen? Well, let's see, because we're going to put that in. We've said that we want to have a referendum to put a choice to the public. That's all it is, putting a choice to the public in 2020. So are they going to get it? No, I mean, look, it's no, hard no, to believe... Not that, listening. Yeah, it's hard to believe that we had a, a once-in-a-lifetime a referendum in 2014, which would be a very short lifetime. And, you know, it, the point well, I have is, if you were going to if you were going to campaign on a referendum uh, basis, why did all your material say this is the stop Brexit election rather than the have a referendum our election? Our, our so, material all said about giving Scotland a choice over its future. I know, but what I'm trying to, to understand, Brexit, the, Drew, what I'm trying to yeah. understand is given what Grant has said, and Boris Johnson has been very clear about mm -hmm. it, he is not going to give permission from Westminster for a Section 30 for you to hold a referendum, what will you do instead? Well, I, I believe it's completely untenable for any one politician, for anybody like Boris Johnson, to say what Scotland or the people of Scotland can 
can and cannot choose yeah, but that is of the what future. He's doing. We so were what promised were the grant, grant. Well, let me finish. Grant mentioned 2014. We were promised in the 2014 independence referendum that if we voted no to independence, then we would retain our place in the European Union. That we would be an equal partner in the United Kingdom. That we would be able to lead if we didn't leave. All that has pro proven to be absolutely false, and the people of Scotland d d are absolutely entitled to look at the situation as it is now and have a choice okay, about I'm how they want to I'm just going to ask you one last future. time and then I'm going to give up because I'm well, not getting an answer. Not so what well, no, I know, but all I'm saying is there, there are things that you could suggest, but given at the moment you're not being offered a Section 30 and, it, and there's well, no prospect there, at the moment you get there has been have no you got a plan B? Well, there, no, been, have you got a plan well, B? Well, Fiona, I think it's really important that the application hasn't been put in yet. I think Boris Johnson can okay, in all we'll seriousness no. look at... I can't, don't think he can all seriously seriousness, look at that and say that he's going to deny what is the democratic right of the Scottish people to choose their own future. Stephen, would, um, Labour, would Labour give a Section 30? Do you think that should happen? I, I believe passionately in our union and I think that it's a, a turbulent and dangerous world out there and the United Kingdom is far better together, much stronger together. So I am not in favour of Scottish independence. I'm not in favour uh, of Welsh independence. One of the reasons I regret my party's decision to back a second referendum is it made it much more difficult for us to have that discussion with but if you uh, wanted a second people referendum, north of the border. Do you think Scotland should get another referendum? But I, I think that that referendum was for a generation. I accept that Brexit will make a big difference you in terms of the economic. Uh, but, but I think that the, it, it, jobs it, it, there, is a, there is a constitutional imperative, which is a Section 30 has to be based on a mutual agreement between the Westminster government. Uh, and the so you would government. deny the people uh, of Scotland the, their choice? Uh, I, I, I believe passionately in you would a, deny the, the people of Scotland their choice. of the United Kingdom is, an, is a code. The rules are the rules. It's just like with a referendum. When you go into a referendum and say, this will be for, it for once in a generation, just as it was with the Brexit referendum, we need to obey and respect those rules. Because Not if listening you, to the people, if you tear up the people rules, who voted yesterday. What's left, what no, left for our democracy up. if you don't respect the let's rules? Let's hear people got to say, yes, the man in the blue sweater then. So if the Scottish people do get a second referendum, will the SNB stand, stand by the result this time if it's the same as it was well, last time? OK, let, let me take a few if you don't mind. Yes, the guy in the grey sweater there, yeah. Um, uh, Drew, if, Scot if Scotland did um, vote to leave uh, the United Kingdom, would you have a hard border between England and Scotland? Yeah. Well, OK, I'm going to take one more and then okay. I'll let you answer. Yes, the woman in the red sweater there. Uh, Mr Hendry. Can you, uh, honest, do you honestly think that Scotland could be self-sufficient outside of the UK financially? Okay. Okay. <laughs> do you want to come back on this? Yeah, absolutely. They're all for me. I'll start in reverse order if I can. I think the idea that uh, Scotland, with uh, all of its resources, its people, um, you know, the, the natural resources it has, a country that's very similar in size in terms of population to Norway uniquely, uh, couldn't survive as an independent nation is, frankly, you know, it, it, it's nonsensical. Um, the fact of the matter is that Scotland has a, a terrific wealth of opportunity, has a terrific wealth of, as a of resources and great people there. Now, I could go into all the different uh, aspects of that, but we don't have yeah. time since I've got three questions. I know, but, and actually, but you it, need to answer them much more briefly, okay, for example. Okay. Anyone else in from the panel? OK. And th th I don't think there's any need for a border. We have never wanted a, a border. And we, the reason we wanted to stay in the European Union is because of the free access that uh, we've got. What we have with Brexit is we're obviously going to see a border down the... Uh, sorry? Yeah. Ireland and Northern Ireland, then we should surely well, have a border between uh, England and England and, and Scotland. Well, look, you know, the, it, Ireland and the independent Ireland and the UK have had free movement of people since they became independent. It was part of the agreement they had uh, over Irish independence. That We've left the, the EU now. OK, hang on. Let, let, let's back on. And also, I, yeah. very briefly, so I'm so sorry, but because I just and, need to bring well, other the, people the in. Final thing, the final thing, I think, was standing by the result. Of course, we stand by the result. The situation, as I've clearly said in 2014, changed radically over the past few years. And we put in our manifesto that should that situation change, we would take the option back to the people. That's what we've done. We, we also, by the way, stood by the Brexit results. So the, the Scottish Government put, said, if you have to do Brexit, OK, we accept it. Here is the compromise we want that will look after Scotland. That was completely okay. ignored. Helen. Look, I think the clue is in the name Scottish National Party. People have been returning you into government in Holyrood now for a decade or more. 
and a majority of seats. I think that is a reasonable mandate to have another referendum. I do, however, I think to entirely take your point that I think the case for independence is harder now. I think a hard border between England and Scotland is almost impossible to see how that would be managed, even with a common travel area, to look at it on customs terms. But I think the mandate is there. I, I, I have to say that the, I, I disagree entirely because referendums are just too important just to be given to the SNP at their whim. It's convenient for us. Now, the, the SNP have got a very clear policy and it's a perfectly moral one and there's nothing... I would fight you at a referendum because I love Scotland. Well, let's you have the referendum and we can fight But, but we've had a referendum. <laughs> and, and actually, I think we ought to just put the SNP's very good results yesterday into a little bit of context. 45% uh, of the vote yesterday, excellent. More than but the, but, more than the but it was 50. Result. But that means 55 percent of the vote was not for the SNP. And in 2015, does that, does that mean the Tories didn't win the election? Drew, Drew, you're going to have to listen at <laughs> some point in this debate. Uh, 2015, the SNP got 50 percent of the vote. So yesterday's good result was sort of scrabbling back to where they were at some point some time ago. The SNP is not this overwhelming force which is knocking Scotland aside. It's it may already be past its high point. OK, well, look. Well, if 45% isn't enough to have a decent mandate, then you guys shouldn't be in government. I mean, it's good enough for you. Why is it enough for them? I'm going to take one final question, if I may, because or else we will run out of time. I wanted to get in Alessandra Perosa. The leader of the Welsh nationalists thinks there should be new legislation to stop politicians lying. Do you think it would be... It would ever be passed? Oh, where shall I come to? <laughs> Grant? <laughs> I think it's highly desirable that just off their own bat and fact checked properly, that politicians should just tell the truth. With fact check, okay. Politicians should just tell the truth. But uh, look, I don't think anyone could imagine a law. Could you imagine how much the time the Supreme Court would spend fact checking one point after uh, another? And in the end, People, and especially nowadays, with all their ability and access to information, are able to find out what's happening out there, uh, be able to do their uh, own res uh, research. Uh, and actually, I think that's a healthy uh, way for a democracy um, to work. Uh, and there are very good independent places to go and look. Look at the Office for National Statistics. Well, look at full if you fact. That wasn't particularly happening. independent, was it, Grant? I mean, that, that was right your on. website well, that you... Uh, right. Fact Check UK, that was it, Fact it Check UK. Up for one hour and have pre Conservative press offers underneath it. But look, I mean... In let's, teeny, look, tiny writing. Hey, look, I, I'm not here to defend every single thing that's ever happened. But what I, the question is, should we, should we have... Any others you want to not defend have, right now? Look, We'd let, love to let hear me, them. Let me, let me ask the question. Should we have the law courts interfering in the political space. No, we shouldn't. Uh, it would, it's for people to um, look at the different pledges and promises made. There are many good, reliable sources, like the Office of National so Statistics. Are you going to take action the, over the law or, courts? Or, for example, the House of Commons. Can I ask you, are you uh, going to take action over the law courts? Are you going to try and change no, the, the law situation courts we have, have now? No, the law courts. the Supreme Court? <laughs> no, the law court has a job to um, do, but that was rather different from a fact-checking point. Helen. I, no. I mean, I spend my days as a journalist trying to find out whether or not journal, um, politicians are lying, but that is a bonkers and illiberal law, and the idea of police being sent round to arrest people for lying is just astonishing to me that anyone would even contemplate that. But that said, I do think we need to have a conversation after this election about the way that we report on politics, about the spread of misinformation, both virally online and through, let's be honest, <laughs> traditional media. This has not been an election in which the media has covered itself in glory. There is an impetus to honestly report anything that anyone has ever told you without passing it through any kind of plausibility filter first. That is a temptation that journalists need to learn much more strongly to resist. Drew? Yeah, well, I think, I think people do have to be held to account for what they say. I, I, I agree that I think it, uh, you, the, there needs to be a discussion about this, there needs to be an examination about it, and there needs to be a calling out of when you have repeated... Uh, lying as we've seen over the past few years. One of the ways that, that I think that we should be tackling is that is to remove the anonymity uh, on social media. You know, people should be held to account for what they say. They shouldn't be able to hide. And this, this information should but be... But how is that going to stop away. politicians lying? That's what Alexander's well, well, talking about. Well, I think, what, you know, the, 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 the lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on is part of the problem with social media at the moment. And it, not being able to identify who's propagating this is part of the problem, I think. But absolutely, we have to have a discussion on this. And Michael, you know a thing or two about politics and fiction. Well, I was just... Dare I say? 
ha having created that wicked, evil, lying Scotsman called Francis Urquhart, <laughs> uh, I would think I it would be a, a terrible tragedy if we um, went too far in actually taking away from you the common sense that you have and the electorates show time and time again judging politicians and trying to give them to judges or some... That is not actually the biggest issue right now. It's not trust in politicians that I think that is the big issue. It's trust in ourselves. And what Drew was just saying about social media and the way that it is, it is spreading like a... It spreads poison amongst us. And we have to find some way of getting a balance back into that discussion that we have through social media. Social media is a wonderful tool, but look what it's done. Yeah, but it's the question, Michael, the question is about holding politicians to account. But, but, I mean, social but, media, we're going to have a conversation about is social media good yeah. or ill. Well, it's I, about holding I, politicians to account. I was just thinking that so, so, social media, you know... It, it OK, well, let's, let's go on about it, social media, because that's but, not actually well, what the well, question but, is about. But, but, In fairness, let's, that's not what the question is about. The question no, is about how do okay. we hold politicians to account. Well, we hold politicians to account at least every five years, and it's a very healthy system, which is... It may have its faults, but it's a hell of a lot better than almost any other system that anybody's devised elsewhere. Steve. So let's carry on with it. I think there is a worrying increase in fake news and uh, all sorts of mistruths and lies which do get um, really rocket boosters put on them by social media. But I think the key part to this question is about a manifesto, actually. And I think that we're increasingly getting questions about what role does a manifesto play really in an election? To what extent do people look at that manifesto and say, right, I'm going to take this at face value, or has this been independently checked? I think we need a piece of primary legislation to say that manifestos should be fundamentally and thoroughly fact-checked by the Office for Budget Responsibility, by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, and by the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, so that when they, they get, they're brought to the people in an election campaign, they've actually been vetted by independent organisations. And I think that would be an excellent way of setting a benchmark against which we can hold what politicians are saying to account. I actually, I think your point about anonymity is really important because there was an incident during this campaign in which a senior Tory aide briefed that Matt Hancock's aide had been punched. And it turned out that so he had walked into someone's arm. This is when he was leaving the hospital right. in Leeds. And that aide... Or, or to take another example of anonymity... Wait, let me finish with mine. Point. Because that aide is entitled to anonymity. So do you think that's right, that an aide can, as it looks very much like, lie to journalists, both uh, Robert Peston and Nora Quinn's vote, apologise for repeating that, and still hide behind a cloak of uh, I, I, I was going to give the, uh, another example of it, which is a Russian document presented, which says something about the NHS, which the leader of the opposition waves around. Again, anonymity created a big grasp. Not, not, not an answer about to my documents. question. Well, I mean, there's Given another example of the same the problem, report. isn't it? A, a document which has no validity still not an answer to at my question. all being waved around as if it was true. So, still not answering. I, 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 look, I just don't know how that incident got going. I'm afraid I didn't see it. Let me, Alessandra, you asked this question. What was behind it? What made you... What's Don't your view on this? an issue. So um, I think the concept per se might be reasonable. So it would help maybe restoring the trust in the politicians. But I think there is a fundamental issue here about, for example, definition. Like, how would you define a lie? Yeah. So I would, I would be interested to see what. Well, the we've certainly thinks. been talking about that, about that a lot. Thank you very much for your question. We could go on, but our hour is up. I'm afraid. Okay. We'll be taking a break over Christmas, yay! And we'll be back on the 9th of January in Oxford and the following week we will be in Liverpool. So call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience or you can go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. But here we are after a momentous election. Who knows where? Who knows, we'll be in five years' time, but let's see where we are after Christmas. Let's kind of curtail our ambitions, shall we? Thank you very much indeed to the panel, to the audience here and, of course, to you at home for watching and listening. From Wandsworth and Question Time, goodbye. Have a happy Christmas. <laughs>